Good evening, and welcome to the Mob Museum's virtual program titled Lee Harvey Oswald and the JFK Assassination, Experts in Dialogue. My name is Jeff Schumacher. I am the Vice President of Exhibits and Programs for the Mob Museum, and I will serve as the moderator for our program. Thank you for taking some time to be with us tonight. I hope you find our conversation well worth your time, and I hope it encourages you to read some of the books authored by our panelists, which are neatly stacked up in the box to my left. Uh, in six days, the nation will mark the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It was on November 22nd, 1963, a Friday afternoon, that President Kennedy was shot while riding in a convertible limousine through Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas. For those who were old enough, that, that day is forever etched in their memories. It seems that almost everybody older than maybe six or seven years old on that day remembers where they were when they heard the news that the president had been shot. Tonight, our panelists are going to dig into exactly what happened on November 22nd, 1963, as well as what happened in the days, months, and years afterward. And our focus is going to be on facts and research. There is little question the JFK assassination marked a major turning point in America. What exactly that turning point has meant to the country over the past 60 years and in the future will be a topic we explore later in the program. So before I introduce our panel, I want to mention that we are very interested in your questions for our panelists. If you have a question, please type it into the chat section and we will consider asking it toward the end of the program. Okay, I'm going to introduce our panel now. We're very proud to have brought together five of the world's foremost experts on the JFK assassination story. We are truly privileged they are here, live and in Technicolor, to offer their insights. I'll start with Gus Russo. Gus is an author, documentarian, and member of the Mob Museum's Advisory Council. He has reported or reported for or, or co-produced a dozen network documentaries on the JFK story, including the 1993 Frontline two-episode special titled, Who Was Lee Harvey Oswald? He is the co-author with Stephen Moulton of Brothers in Arms, The Kennedys, The Castros, and The Politics of Murder. Next up, Dale K. Myers, a 43-year veteran of radio and television, which will become evident when you hear him speak. <laughs> Dale has been a subject matter expert and technical consultant for dozens of television programs on the JFK story. He's also an award-winning computer animator, who is perhaps best known for his computer animated reconstruction of the JFK assassination that was originally featured on an ABC News special in 2003. We'll come back to that. He is the author of With Malice, Lee Harvey Oswald and the Murder of Officer J.D. Tippett. We are very pleased to have Bert Griffin with us tonight. Uh, Bert was the assistant counsel to the Warren Commission, the presidential commission that investigated, investigated the JFK assassination. Bert's primary responsibility was to investigate Jack Ruby, the man who shot and killed Oswald two days after Oswald assassinated the president. Bert is the author of JFK, Oswald, and Ruby, Politics, Prejudice, and Truth. It is very exciting to have Alicia P. Long with us tonight. Alicia is a history professor at Louisiana State University, where she teaches courses on, among other things, the history of conspiracy in the United States. Her focus on Louisiana history led her to explore the story of New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison in her book, Cruising for Conspirators, How a New Orleans DA Prosecuted the Kennedy Assassination as a Sex Crime. And last, but far from least, we have Fred Litwin uh, with us. Fred is an all-around expert on the JFK story, a meticulous researcher and prolific writer on the subject. His latest book is Oliver Stone's Film Flam, The Demagogue of Dealey Plaza. Now, each of our panelists is going to give a short presentation uh, outlining the major points and findings from the research. Afterward, I'll lead a more casual conversation, and then we will try to answer a few questions posed by members of our audience. So let's start, we're going to go ahead and start with Gus, uh, and he'll give us an overview of the assassination and then his, his findings from his work. Go ahead, Gus. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and uh, thanks for having me summarize the case in six minutes. Um, <laughs> I, lo I love a challenge, so buckle up and uh, I'm going to read from my notes. And, and, and to those people out there in the audience, uh, you know, sit down, 
please. No, you know, relax. <laughs> uh, uh, so the question we're dealing with, the main question, did Lee Oswald alone shooting from a building he worked in behind the point of impact kill the president? Uh, some misunderstandings about this event can be attributed to a lack of historical perspective. When JFK was killed, real-time reporting had to be invented on the spot. It was the first breaking news. Not only was the media unprepared, but so were presidential security and law enforcement. Keep in mind, the last success, successful presidential attack was against William McKinley 62 years earlier. Hence, there was a degree of chaos and reporting errors, unreliable eye and ear witnesses popped up everywhere. But the police, the FBI, CIA, and NSA put all hands on deck and got to work. And here's just some of the evidence they uncovered. A rifle, per, a, a rifle Oswald purchased was found in a building behind the president and was ballistically matched to the only intact bullet found at the hospital. X-rays showed clear evidence of an entry wound in the back of JFK's head. Oswald's prints were on both the rifle and the boxes surrounding the sniper's perch behind Kennedy. There was a very good eyewitness to Oswald aiming out the window at the time of the shooting, where the spent shells that Oswald also purchased were found. Oswald alone fled the scene of the crime. Oswald had a history of political violence. He tried to murder anti-Castro firebrand General Edwin Walker seven months earlier. So when the Warren report came out, uh, keep in mind that Americans trusted their government back then. Uh, the Warren report came out 10 months after the assassination, summarizing about 25,000 interviews. So 80% of Americans actually accepted it when it came out. So people trusted their government at that point. But what happened was a couple of years later, Mark Lane came out with his book, Rush to Judgment, a big bestseller. And his surgical editing of the Warren Report was convincing to a gullible young generation and to people who didn't read the actual document. Now, 80% didn't believe the government's account, especially because the bulk of the FBI's work was still secret and the film of the shooting was also under wraps. As if Lane's own distortions weren't bad enough, both he and a disturbed district attorney you're going to hear about were being fed KGB disinformation about the CIA, the assassination, and innocent Americans. However, there were government cover-ups and explosive secrets, but they weren't about why they but they were about why Oswald did it. And nobody, not LBJ, RFK, the CIA, the FBI, Russian, Cuban, and Mexican intelligence wanted these secrets to come out. And that's where my work has been focused. Can we have the first photo, please? Oswald was infatuated with both Castro and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, or FPCC, a pro-Castro group with a terrorist wing that was secretly funded by Havana. A year before the assassination, the FBI thwarted the FPCC's planned massive bombings of five New York department stores on the busiest shopping day of the year, Black Friday. It would have been deadlier than 9-11. This is the FPCC that Oswald was a member of. At the same time, the CIA, at the direction of the Kennedys, was making plans to assassinate Castro and reinvade Cuba during the upcoming presidential campaign season. Unlike most Americans, Oswald was informed of the reinvasion plans by the FPCC, which had spies in the CIA's training camps. After Dallas, CIA Director McCone, Bobby Kennedy, Johnson, and Kennedy family friend and former CIA Director Alan Dulles whom Bobby wanted on the commission, kept these plots from the other commissioners because it might have started World War III and obliterated the Kennedy family legacy. But the truth started to trickle out eventually. In 1975, the church committee finally released the story of the plots against Castro. In 1995, the FBI released one of the last Warren Commission records, which confirmed that Castro told a top FBI informant that when Oswald visited the Cuban embassy in Mexico, seven weeks before the assassination, he yelled, I'll kill that bastard Kennedy. That's Castro admitting that to an FBI informant. Um, okay, then in 1996, CIA officers admitted that audio tapes of Oswald in that Cuban embassy were sent to headquarters. They have since disappeared. 
Other agency personnel testified that there were surveillance photos of Oswald at the Cuban embassy. The photos also disappeared, perhaps because the CIA contractor who ran the agency's Mexican surveillance operations was this guy. Second, next photo, please. Here he is hugging the guy we hired him to spy against, Fidel Castro. His name was Fernando Gutierrez Barrios, the head of Mexican federal security and a longtime pal of Castro's. He helped Castro launch the revolution in 1956. He also ran Mexico's brutal Brigada Blanca death squad on the side. The Brigada murdered hundreds of political opponents. This was the CIA's surveillance contractor in Mexico City, and his cameramen were mostly Cubans. Thus, Cuban intelligence knew exactly where the agency's cameras were located. Next photo, please. These photos of CIA photo and listening posts in Mexico City were taken by the Cubans from their embassy. So it was essentially Cubans photographing other Cubans who allegedly worked for the Americans. This was Casablanca on steroids. And keep in mind that the Cubans hated JFK. Next photo, please. Here's a photo of a float that was paraded before the Castro brothers and Che Guevara in Havana's Revolutionary Square one year before the assassination. The words on the mock casket read, Mr. Kennedy lies here. The Cuban Revolution killed him. In 2014, the CIA released a bombshell internal report that admitted to their role in the cover-up. Quote, CIA Director McCone may be regarded as a co-conspirator in the JFK assassination cover-up. McCone could rest assured that his predecessor, Alan Dulles, would work to keep the commission from pursuing anti-Castro covert, covert operations, end quote. That's the CIA saying that, not me. In summation, official Washington was terrified that Cuban intelligence was involved. It wasn't Alan Dulles or Clay Shaw or E. Howard Hunt on the grassy knoll. And so I conclude that Oswald made the offer in Mexico and Cuban intelligence encouraged him. And that was your cover up. Back to you, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you, Gus. Very excellent. Um, so Dale is next up. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about uh, part of the case that most people don't know about. And that is how Oswald came to be arrested. And that was for murdering Officer J.D. Tippett. Um, will you share my screen here? I'm going to walk you through some uh, graphics that I've assembled here, kind of give you the lay of the land. Uh, in the center of the screen and down at the bottom, this is Central Oak Cliff. This is where Oswald had a rooming house where ultimately he shot Tippett and was arrested. If you look up here in the upper uh, right, uh, or the upper part of the screen, you'll see the location of the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, after the shooting, Oswald escaped the book depository within just a few minutes, got on a bus that got snarled in traffic, and then finally got into a cab that took him across the uh, Houston Street viaduct uh, to his uh, the area of his rooming house. I say the area because it didn't actually drop him at the room. It took him five blocks past it and then dropped him off, an obvious uh, indication that Oswald was trying to cover where he actually lived. He then hoofed it back to the rooming house, went in, and he was only in there for a very few minutes, uh, came out zipping up a short gray coat, and then 15 minutes later encountered Officer J.D. Tippett in the central Oak Cliff area, and that's where the shooting occurred. Uh, so let's take a look here. I'll give you a, a real brief rundown of uh, the shooting using these uh, 3D graphics that I put together. Um, you'll see the, this is the corner of 10th and Patton here. Oswald was walking down the street and by all accounts uh, was walking toward Officer Tippett, who's coming down the street toward him. There were two witnesses who were nearby, Helen Markham, on her way to uh, her job and was going to catch a bus about a block away, and William Scoggins, a cab driver, who's eating his lunch. Something happened right here, and I think based on the eyewitness testimony, that Oswald did a quick about-face just shy of the corner here, and that's what drew Officer Tippett's attention. So Tippett pulls up alongside Oswald, about the uh, second house down from the corner, and uh, they talk briefly through the side window, the vent side window. Uh, it's only just a few 
seconds, maybe 10 seconds, actually. Helen Markham, Scoggins are looking on. Then uh, uh, Tippett emerges from the driver's side and starts walking toward the left front of the automobile. Suddenly, Oswald pulls out a pistol and fires several quick shots across the hood of the car, striking Officer Tippett four times, killing him instantly. Oswald then left the car and ran toward the corner of 10th and Patton while Helen Markham and William Scoggins looked on. As he cut across this corner house, there were two women inside, sisters-in-law actually, Barbara and Virginia Davis. They came to the screen door and watched as Oswald passed only just a few feet away. They saw that he had his revolver open. He was shaking shells out, and they were actually found in these bushes. The cab driver, crouched down next to his cab, heard Oswald say either poor dumb cop or poor damn cop as he ran by. A block away is a used car lot. Here's where the shooting occurred up here in the upper right. Oswald started down Patton Street, crossed the street, and as he's running down Patton toward Jefferson Boulevard, a used car manager, Ted Calloway, comes out of his office and runs to the sidewalk after hearing the shots. As Oswald is directly across the street from him, he hollers out to him, hey, man, what the hell is going on? Oswald kind of slowed as if he realized he was drawing attention to himself, shrugged his shoulders, and continued on. As he made his way toward the corner, there was another used car lot across the street where Warren Reynolds and B.M. Patterson were uh, in an upper story office with two other men. They had heard the shots had come out. They saw this gunman running down to the corner, and as Oswald turned the corner, these two guys decided, let's follow him and see where he's going. So they did, at a discreet distance. So as Oswald made his way down Jefferson Boulevard, Warren Reynolds and B.M. Patterson are following. They see him, Oswald, as he nears the corner of Crawford and Jefferson Boulevard, and he ducks behind a Texaco service station. Later, a jacket is found behind one of the cars, and Oswald then apparently continues westward. Now, police, of course, poured into the area. Here's where Oswald ditched the jacket. And seven blocks later, Oswald turns up near the Texas Theater. Just before getting there, He stepped into the vestibule of Hardy Shoe Store, where Johnny Brewer, the shoe store manager, saw a suspicious-looking character, who's Oswald, looking nervous, looking over his shoulder. And when Oswald turned and started up the street toward the Texas Theater, Brewer stepped out and was standing in front of his shoe store. He's watching Oswald as Oswald makes his way toward the front entrance of the Texas Theater. Just as he's about to reach it, a Dallas police car screams by, And the ticket taker, Julia Postal, comes out of the ticket booth and is standing with her back to Oswald, who then slips into the theater behind her back. And, of course, up the street here, Johnny Brewer sees all this happen. So he goes up, knowing Julia Postal, and he says, hey, did that guy buy a ticket? And she says, no, he didn't. And so they end up calling police. Well, police storm the theater, and we're looking at the theater from the screen uh, side of uh, of the theater. We're looking toward the back. And Oswald had positioned himself, actually he started in the fifth seat, and as police poured into the theater, the house lights came up. He stood up from the fifth seat, stepped to the aisle as if he wanted to leave, and then thought better of it and sat back down in the second seat, which is where he was sitting when Officer Nick McDonald approached him. When McDonald got next to him, he said, get on your feet. And Oswald stood up, brought his hands up shoulder high, and said, this is it. It's all over now. Then he slugged McDonald, reached into his waistband, pulled out the pistol he had shot J.D. Tippett with, and pointed it at McDonald's head. McDonald grabbed the cylinder to keep the gun from firing, and a scuffle ensued. Other police officers jumped in, and they uh, subdued Oswald, took him out of the theater, and, of course, he was screaming police brutality. What's interesting is that when they got him back to police headquarters, uh, they were taking affidavits from employees of the Texas School Book Depository, and the uh, one of the employees said, hey, that's Lee. And they said, what? Yeah, that's Lee. He works with us at the book depository. And you know that right then police knew they had the prime suspect in the Kennedy shooting. Now, what I'd like to show you real quick is the evidence in the Tippett shooting against Oswald. First, there were 11 eyewitnesses that saw either Tippett murdered or his killer flee the scene. All of them identified Oswald as that person, and five of them, in fact, picked Oswald out of a lineup within hours of the murder. 
The pistol that he had in his hand at the time of the shooting was ordered under the name A. Heidel, for which Oswald had identification, false identification in, in his wallet at the time of his arrest with his photo on it. And in fact, the gun was shipped to a post office box that Oswald himself had uh, uh, rented. The four shells that were found at the scene were fired in that revolver that Oswald had in his possession at the arrest to the exclusion of all other revolvers. The bullets pulled from Tippa could not be matched conclusively to Oswald's revolver due to the fact they were fired in an oversized barrel. So it created strange scratches on the bullets that didn't match each other, even test bullets that had been fired. Uh, but Oswald's revolver could not be excluded from among those that could have fired those bullets. And finally, the coup de grace for me was this. The jacket that was dumped on the Texas uh, parking lot, the Tex Texaco uh, parking lot. There was an FBI report that actually was uh, in the Warren Commission files that conspiracy theorists had known about for 30 years. I happened upon it at the National Archives one day. The FBI did a fiber check of the sleeves. And in the sleeves, I found fibers that matched in microscopic characteristics the shirt that Oswald was wearing at the time of his arrest. So for me, there's absolutely no question, no matter what you believe about the Kennedy assassination, Oswald did murder Officer J.D. Tippett. Thank you, Dale. I mean, this is talk about detail. You know, that's incredible. Um, uh, Bert, uh, you are up with your presentation. Well, my responsibility with the uh, Warren Commission, uh, I was assistant counsel to the Warren Commission, uh, was the uh, activity of, of Jack Ruby. Uh, Jack Ruby actually was the first private conspiracy investigator. Why do I say that? And what was this all about? Because Jack Ruby very quickly uh, came to suspect and fear that Jews were going to be blamed for the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, Ruby's what, uh, name at birth was Jacob Rubenstein. Uh, his family all changed their name in the late 1940s. So uh, he was known as Jack Ruby when he was in Dallas. But uh, like any person uh, who has grown up as a member of the Jewish faith, uh, uh, the awareness of anti-Semitism uh, was very prominent. Uh, when Jack Ruby heard about the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, he was in the uh, Dallas Morning News Advertising Department. He, uh, he operated in Dallas a strip tease club, and he was placing ads for the uh, weekend activities. Uh, there was a full-page, black-bordered advertisement, anti-Kennedy advertisement, in the Dallas Morning News on the day of the assassination. Uh, Ruby had seen this ad uh, even before he heard, heard about the assassination of the president. But when word came, uh, and he was Ruby was at the Dallas Morning News at that point, when word came that the president had been shot, uh, Ruby was very, very upset about this advertisement. Uh, it was an anti-Kennedy advertisement. Uh, it was signed with the name Bernard Weissman, and it had a black border on it, full-page advertisement. Uh, Ruby was a Kennedy fan, uh, and he did not believe that anybody who was Jewish would be anti-Kennedy. So he associated in his own mind the black border with some uh, foretelling of Kennedy's death and began to think that the blackboarded advertisement with the Weissman name uh, was in some way connected to the assassination. So he began to search for Weissman. Uh, uh, Ruby was a, a first-class investigator. Uh, he looked in the telephone directory and didn't find uh, Bernard Weissman's name. Uh, a friend of his suggested that he look in a street directory, and he didn't find Weissman's name. Uh, in fact, he didn't know of anybody named Weissman. And he believed that there was no such person as Weissman. In fact, there was, and we can tell, talk about that story later. But uh, 
but his own perspective was that nobody who was Jewish would sign an anti-Kennedy ad. And therefore, the name Bernard Weissman was placed on the ad, and the ad was through the, the uh, black border on the ad, must be connected with the assassination, and Jews would be blamed because of the connection with this ad. Uh, so he began to uh, get as much information as he could about Weissman. He went to temple services that Friday night, and then after temple services, he went to a delicatessen where he bought six corned beef sandwiches and six, six soft drinks and took them to the police station uh, as a way to be get into the police station. And, and because of his own business of operating nightclubs, he knew police officers. He had to keep uh, his, in order to keep his business uh, in uh, out, of, out, of, out of difficulty, it was helpful to know police officers. In fact, there was a Dallas police officer that was dating and ultimately married one of his strippers. Uh, so Ruby uh, went with his corned beef sandwiches to the uh, Dallas Police Department. The police said they'd already had meals. They didn't need anything. But he stayed on anyhow and told the uh, Dallas police that he was a reporter for the Israeli, a, a translator for the Israeli news. Uh, and uh, he made himself a little badge, uh, a hand, uh, hand uh, uh, made, made badge that he put on his uh, coat. Uh, he was dressed as people were in the 60s with a coat and tie and suit and as someone would have been who had gone to Friday night services. Uh, when Oswald was finally uh, presented at a, at a midnight press conference on the night of the assassination, Ruby was present. Uh, and I'm sorry we don't have the photograph uh, of Ruby because it's very clear that Ruby is standing in a group of uh, newspaper reporters uh, with a uh, pen or a pen pencil in his hand and a notebook. Uh, he spent uh, the time after Oswald was presented uh, to, for viewing, uh, he then helped the, the, the uh, out-of-town newspaper reporters uh, get interviews with Henry Wade, who incidentally uh, is the Wade of Ro, uh, Ro, Roe v. Wade. Uh, and uh, uh, so he, he was trying to gather as much information from the police as he could. It then occurred to him after the press conference that there might be a connection between a John Birch Society billboard that was on a nearby uh, uh, street or, or, or near one of the freeways, a, a, uh, a billboard that said, impeach Earl Warren. Uh, and uh, Ruby uh, then contacted his roommate. He was he was unmarried. He, his roommate was a older man named G George Senator, and called his night watchman, uh, Larry Crayford, uh, and the three of them went out with a camera to view the impeach Earl Warren billboard. Incidentally, uh, Ruby didn't know who Earl Warren was. Uh, and uh, these were his activities, really, that in, in trying to get information about Oswald for the next two days. Uh, he didn't get a lot of sleep. Uh, he was taking uh, some kind of sleeping pills to keep himself awake. Uh, and uh, he later said that he thought he might be affected by drugs. Uh, but uh, he got a telephone call uh, on early Sunday morning. Uh, from one of his strippers who was pro professionally known as Little Lynn. And Little Lynn needed money because he had closed his uh, nightclubs for the weekend and the Little Lynn had not been paid. The dancers didn't have any work to do. And Little Lynn uh, needed money to pay her rent and to buy food. And Ruby said, well, he was going down to the uh, police station uh, because Oswald uh, had not been moved as he was supposed to be later that day from uh, the Dallas police station to the Dallas County Jail. The Western Union office was one block away 
from the Dallas police station uh, at 11, uh, uh, shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, when incidentally it, it had been expected that Oswald might be moved as early as 10 o'clock, uh, but he had not been moved. And shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning, he stood in line at a Western Union office behind a man who was a customer there uh, and sent a, a $25 money order uh, from Western Union uh, to Little Inn that was timed at 11.17. He then saw that there was a crowd of people gathered outside of the exit from the Dallas police garage. And obviously it was clear that Oswald had not been moved. Now, for dog lovers, you may be interested in knowing that that Ruby brought uh, to the parking lot across the street from uh, the Western Union office, his favorite dog. He had, uh, he had seven dogs and his favorite dog was Sheba uh, to whom he told friends that he was married to Sheba. Uh, and and uh, in any event, he left Sheba in, in the in the parking lot in the car, uh, took with him uh, as as he often carried his pistol because he had a lot of money on him. Was able to enter the the garage as the uh, as as a police car was exiting the garage, and the uh, the officer who was standing at the top of the the ramp to the garage uh, had walked out into the street to make sure that. The police car could get out without being interfered with. And Ruby was able to walk uh, down the ramp. And uh, at 1121, just four minutes after he sent his uh, money order to, to Little Lynn, he shot Oswald. Uh, uh, so... Uh, Bert, Bert, why don't we why don't we leave it why don't we leave it there uh, we'll come back to we'll come back to uh ruby uh in a, okay, in a few okay. minutes thanks thanks jeff okay thank you i mean clearly not the uh the uh planning that a, a hit man generally would uh would go through um all right um alicia it's your turn great First of all, thank you for having me. It is an honor to be in such distinguished company of researchers. And as these presentations we have seen suggest to us, people know about these events in great detail um, and important detail. And of course, the question of who killed the president is an extraordinarily important question. And it's not a surprise that it draws such intense um, research, but also emotion. Um, often with regard to defending one's findings. And this lone gunman and conspiracy question, understandably, lies at the center of most publications related to the Kennedy assassination. There's no question about that, and there's no question that that's important literature. But I really think as a historian that the huge archive related to the Kennedy assassination actually presents us opportunities to enter these questions from different directions, maybe uh, create new narratives um, and have the opportunity to explore sort of under explored areas related to the assassination. And so I came to this uh, question really as a historian of Louisiana and particularly New Orleans and a historian of the 20th century U.S. and also a historian of the history of sexuality. And so those are sort of my, you know, uh, tripod of interest that brought me to these questions. And um as a historian, I'm also really interested in the origins of things. So while many people get interested in these questions on November 22nd, 1963, in terms of determining events, or maybe within the six months before that, um, I wanted to understand the context in New Orleans that led to Jim Garrison's investigation and the prosecution of Clay Shaw. And so uh, I needed to do two things to understand that. And one of the things I needed to understand was the uh, setting in New Orleans in the late 1950s and the context of what life was like for gay people during the decades of the 1950s and the 1960s. So that required a sort of a lot of local research to uh, understand those kinds of questions. And then the other thing I wanted to understand is not just how Jim Garrison 
got elected district attorney in 1962. It's important to understand that, but also how he operated as a politician and a lawyer in the years leading up to being elected and in the years immediately after being elected district attorney. And you start to see patterns in his behavior that emerge long before the assassination and long before he starts looking into the assassination. So that's what I mean by origins. I wanted to set a really deep context for understanding what happened when he begins to look into the assassination. So that's sort of my, uh, you know, original approach to all of this. And um, I will just say for those of you who might not be familiar with this, that nearing the third anniversary of the assassination, the district attorney of New Orleans, Orleans Parish, Jim Garrison starts his own investigation into the Kennedy assassination. And again, if you're not familiar, it's a head scratcher as to why there's an investigation into an assassination that took place in Dallas, Texas, uh, by a district attorney of Orleans Parish. And what Garrison needed uh, to um, justify this investigation was a crime committed in his jurisdiction. And because Lee Harvey Oswald, a New Orleans native, had spent about six months in the city in the lead up in the months leading to the investigation um, or the assassination, excuse me, you know, he began to look at um, Lee Harvey Oswald and his potential associates. Unfortunately, he began to look at this question through the stories two people told the weekend after the assassination. And I can talk about this in more detail if you like, but I think it is not an understatement to say that both of these people were unreliable narrators and they told fantastic stories that weekend. And so when Jim Garrison starts looking into this question in 1966, he starts with those stories. And what he does is take pieces and parts from each story, merge them together, and create a new trio of conspirators, Lee Harvey Oswald, now dead, uh, David Ferry, soon to be dead, and someone named Clay Bertrand, who to this point had never been identified. And um, so he decides when he's under a lot of pressure in uh, early March of 1967 to make an arrest, he identifies Clay Shaw as a person who was, in fact, the elusive Clay Bertrand arrests him, charges him with conspiracy, and essentially dogs him through the rest of his life. And one thing that gets left out of a lot of this is that after two years of investigation and prosecution and about six weeks of trial, the jury went into its deliberations and in under an hour returned a unanimous not guilty verdict for Clay Shaw in this question of conspiracy in the assassination of President Kennedy. Um, and for a lot of reasons, it's unfortunate that uh, Clay Shaw died in the early 1970s. But one of the most important reasons uh, that it matters is because um, um, one of the most important reasons is that after he died, people like Garrison can say whatever they like about him. They can impugn him. They can move the evidence around to make their cases. And so I really found um, a flimsy investigation that for a variety of reasons took off and got a lot of cultural traction um, and in the 1990s, of course, because um, Oliver Stone makes a movie about this, um, Jim Garrison's uh, version of these events is what gets sort of, uh, you know, fixed in the cultural imagination. So I just think, you know, that's kind of how I got into this. And I will just say one last thing, which is that I think this story illuminates parts of LGBT history. Um, that have not traditionally been a part of Kennedy assassination literature, but also, uh, you know, Shaw's story is not really integrated into the history of LGBTQ people in the United States. And so I hope the book begins to correct both those misapprehensions. And that's where I'm coming from. And that's what I did. And um, you can see from the work of these other gentlemen that excellent work has been done on these granular questions related to the assassination. And I hope I've brought some new questions and some new insights about Jim Garrison's investigation. Thank you, Alicia. You definitely have. Um, uh, so let's wrap this up with Fred. Uh, go ahead, Fred. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I really appreciate the Mob Museum for organizing this. When I uh, wrote my first book, I was a teenage JFK conspiracy freak. Uh, one of my friends left a review on Amazon that said, well, you know, it's a good book, but it's not really about the assassination. And he thought that I was going to be upset about that. And in fact, he was right. My book really uh, was not about the assassination. It was about conspiracy theories and the people who espouse these theories and what it does to people, innocent people. And the reason I do this and the reason all three of my books debunk conspiracy theories is that JFK conspiracy theory is not just a nice little fun enterprise that you can do in the basement of your house 
doesn't hurt anybody. You can find all your friends on the bulletin boards. You can espouse ridiculous theories and have a lot of fun. The fact is it hurts real life people. And there's victims all over the place from people who believe in conspiracies. So Alicia just talked about Clay Shaw, but most people don't realize that Jim Garrison charged another person, Edgar Eugene Bradley, who was a promoter of Christian radio. Garrison charged him with conspiring to kill, to kill Kennedy as well. And that, you know, puts a little crimp in his life and he had to hire a, a lawyer to represent him. And fortunately, Ronald Reagan would not allow him to be extradited from California. There were a lot of other victims of Jim Garrison. Uh, Carlos Bringier, who was an anti-Castro Cuban uh, living in New Orleans, uh, he was a suspect of Garrison's and his wife was so nervous that he decided to send her to Argentina to live because uh, he wanted to calm her down. And while she was there, she was so worried he would be arrested, she had a miscarriage. Uh, another anti-Castro Cuban uh, who had lived in New Orleans but moved to Dallas, Sergio Arcacha Smith, uh, he was a Garrison suspect. Garrison tried to have him extradited to New Orleans, and he lost his job when that became public. Um, if we go to today, you'll find that Ruth Payne, Ruth Payne, the nice woman who took in Marina Oswald as a boarder, um, she is now being accused of having ties to the CIA. In fact, last year there was a film documentary about Ruth Payne with all sorts of accusations, uh, ridiculous accusations, and a very good woman who did a very good deed has now had her reputation besmirched by conspiracy theorists. Now, it's even worse than that. Back in the 1980s, Ruth Payne decided to go fight poverty in Nicaragua. And while she was there, uh, a JFK conspiracy theorist uh, sort of recognized her and then shot, thought that she was CIA and thought that she was going to help the Contras, made her life miserable, and she had to move back to the States. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, Oliver Stone's latest documentary series, JFK Destiny Betrayed, has a very large segment about George Berkeley who was JFK's personal physician. Now, like many people, some of the principals in the JFK case also do read conspiracy books. And at some point, Berkeley started to believe in conspiracies. And he told a conspiracy author in the early 1980s that he was very suspicious and they thought there was a conspiracy. That author then went and turned that suspicion into, oh, Kennedy's doctor thought there was two gunmen. And then that morphed into, oh, my God, he was at the autopsy. He was at Parkland Hospital. There's something strange with the medical evidence. He knows something about what really happened, and he's covering it up. And Oliver Stone went so far as to basically accuse Berkeley of not only being involved in a cover-up, but covering up the truth to protect his family from knowing what he had done in the, in the early 1960s. He brought his family into it. I mean... How low can you go? Um, I can go on to there's many, many other victims um, in this assassination. The road, the road to, to conspiracy hell is paved with good, good, innocent victims. It's very unfortunate. Thank you, Fred. Um, you know, these presentations are all incredible. Uh, you know, if we ended the program right now, I think it would be well, it will have would have been well worth everyone's time. Uh, but we're not done. Uh, for the next several minutes, I'm going to pepper our panelists uh, with questions about various aspects of the JFK case. We'll re revisit some of the topics uh, that have been addressed here. And uh, much like with the presentations, I expect uh, we will cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. That's our goal. Um, so I want to start with one of the interesting things about our panel, and this kind of touches on what, uh, uh, what, what Fred just mentioned is that uh, at least three of you can remember a time when you believed there was a conspiracy to kill the president. In other words, that Oswald was not a lone gunman. Um, I'd like to explore with each of you what led you to believe there was a conspiracy and how your thinking evolved. Uh, Dale, let's start with you. I know that you were uh, a disc jockey for a radio station when you first took an interest in the JFK story. Why don't you uh, explain your JFK journey? If you would. Well, I was a disc jockey uh, in upstate Michigan and worked in radio for 10 years, actually. But one of my first jobs was in Cadillac, Michigan. And in 1975, 
the JFK uh, Zapruder film was broadcast for the first time. That's what got my interest. And I think some of our panelists will find that that's sort of the touchstone moment. And uh, so I had gone to the library and ended up getting, uh, I was looking for a book that talked about the Zapruder film. And uh, I found, oh, here's a book, Six Seconds in Dallas by Josiah Thompson, which our panelists will recognize as one of the premier conspiracy books of all time. Mm -hmm. So after reading that, I thought, wow, there's a lot more to this than I ever thought. So I got more books and more books and so forth. And over the next 10 years, kind of went the, the long way around the barn. You know, I tell people that you can't help but think there was a conspiracy if you read the literature that's out there, because 90 percent of it is conspiracy oriented. You have no frame of reference. Um, but if you stick with it, and especially if you actually read the Warren report, you know, start with the basics. And then for me, uh, I got a hold of uh, Mark Lane's rush to judgment. And he was talking about the Tippett shooting, which I had an intense interest in at the time. And he had written the most up to that point, about 14 pages. And so I ordered all of the documents that he had cited in the back of his book. And I got them from the National Archives and found, oh, my God, he's taken all of this stuff out of context or he's just flat out lied about it. So if you dig down deep, you find that a lot of these books don't hold water. So I ended up going all the way around the barn. It took me a long time, but eventually... I came to believe that now it's Oswald and it's Oswald alone. Thank you. Now, Fred, uh, you have a, uh, that same touchstone, I believe. And one thing, I'm, if you could, to first explain why the, the first national broadcast of the Zapruder film was why people, why people saw it as proving a conspiracy or suggesting a conspiracy. Well, it was the first time it had been shown on national television. And, of course, the headshot, which was supposedly fired from behind, you see Kennedy's head go violently back into the left. That's where the back into the left comes from. And that was a very big shock for me and for millions of other people seeing it on national television for the first time. But I had a different question after I saw that. And the question that I wanted answered was I knew the Warren Commission had seen the Zapruder film. And so I wanted to figure out why were they not persuaded by the head snap? What is there must be something missing to this, this story because they saw this murder film. They did not say that he was shot from the front. And so the, I went to the library and the first book I read was all, uh, Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment. And he said in his book that the autopsy x-rays and photos had been confiscated by federal agents. Um, but I realized that his book was written in 1966. It was now 1975. And I went to the periodical indexes and I started to read all the various Time and Newsweek articles to catch up to 1975. And I found out in 1972, two doctors had actually examined JFK's autopsy, x-rays and photographs. I got their addresses. I wrote Dr. Cyril Weck, the foremost, one of the foremost forensic pathologists of the United States, and Dr. John Latimer. I wrote them. They both sent me all of their articles. And both of them agreed that Kennedy was shot from behind. And I really felt, well, if one of the best forensic pathologists thinks that Kennedy was shot from behind, who am I to argue? It uh, doesn't leave much for me. And But I was very worried about the single, single bullet theory, and that was where I had some doubts. I actually put the whole assassination away for many, many years. And in 1991, I was living in England, and I saw an advertisement for a CD-ROM of all the evidence from the House Select Committee on Assassinations, I ordered the CD-ROM and I was absolutely floored at the fact there was all this scientific testing that was done by the HSCA and it all supported a lone gunman. And that's when I realized, you know what, I've been misled my whole life. Well, my, well since 1975, I've been misled. Uh, Oswald did it and he did it alone. Very good. Uh, I want to uh, go to Gus next. Uh, Gus, you're, uh, uh, it, was it the Zapruder film for you as well that kind of got you going on this, or what, did it start earlier? Uh, well, pretty much like Dale, um, what did it for me was Rush to Judgment. Uh, you know, I was a, a young teenager when the book came out, and uh, at first I think I saw Mark Lane on TV or something, and uh, it was powerful. He, you know, he was a decent lawyer, I guess. He knew how to present his case uh, for Oswald. And uh, then I read the book and uh, silly me, I didn't know that authors could lie like that. I assumed he was telling the truth, you know, and, uh, 
so I bought into it big time. And then uh, there was a guy in Canada who was selling bootleg uh, copies of the Zapruder film, eight millimeter. And uh, I bought one, maybe dailed it. I don't, I don't know, but uh, uh, I still have it. And so I got the Zapruder film before it was really uh, out there. And to me, that looked like he was shot from the front. So I, I was full bore ahead. And, you know, and then in the early 70s, remember, there was the paranoid cinema stuff that was going on. Winter Kills, Blowout, um, Executive Action, all these conspiracy movies that were really powerful and very well done. Uh, so I was a believer that there was a shot from the front and there was a big cover up until I started uh, reading what the or, or seeing what the HSCA, the House Committee, was doing in the late 70s. I actually attended all the, all the most of the open hearings and I was very impressed with their scientific work um, on the uh, forensics, the trajectory. And I was there when they showed the real clear Zapruder film. I was in the room when they showed it. I, I made my way to the front row. And uh, you could see when they slowed it down that the first shot moved or the shot that hit Kennedy in the head moved his head forward before it went back. You couldn't see that on the blurry bootleg I had. So at that point, I knew Oswald did it, you know, based on all the work the HSCA did. So the only question for me then was, why did he do it? Did anybody know he was going to do it? And uh, that's where my work took off from there. But, you know, like I say, for about the first you know dozen years or so, um, you know, I, I was a believer that uh, there was a lot to it. And uh, I will have to say, because uh, Bert's here, uh, I didn't read all 26 volumes. If I, if I did, I probably wouldn't have believed Mark Lane. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I was too busy playing rock and roll or something. But there you go. Very good. Uh, uh, Bert, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to speak on this topic, even if it's brief. Um, I mean, you participated in the Warren Commission investigation. So then in the years following its release, you watched as various individuals, we've heard some of their names, uh, came forward and tried to pick it apart. Um, did you ever waver in your belief in the commission's conclusions? I didn't waver in my belief in the commission's conclusions, but uh, I started uh, with the Warren Commission with great doubt as to whether the FBI was was acting accurate or truthful. Uh, I had been an assistant United States attorney prosecuting criminal cases in my hometown, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I came away from that experience uh, with a concern and a fear that they were, the agents were completely dominated uh, by the attitude of their boss, J. Edgar Hoover. And I, and I knew that Hoover uh, very much would it was it was very much an anti-communist, and it would be very easy for Hoover uh, to attempt to gather information that would show that Oswald, a Marxist, was guilty. So, one, I started with skepticism uh, about the accuracy of the information that we might be getting from the FBI. I didn't feel that way about the Secret Service. I didn't know anything about the CIA. Uh, but... I want to say to you that uh, when we had our first staff meeting uh, and the chief justice uh, addressed us, uh, his message was, your only client is the truth. And that that affected all of us. Uh, and I want to say that uh, we all wanted to find the conspiracy. Uh, and I've said to people elsewhere, uh, you know, if I could have found a conspiracy, uh, I'd have been the, the senator from Ohio and not John Glenn. Uh, the, <laughs> we knew, uh, you know, we, we, we knew that the country was in danger, that, that if we did, if there was a conspiracy and we did not find it, then the country was in very, very great danger. Uh, and uh, we were all old enough to have been influenced by the Second World War. Uh, so we wanted to find a conspiracy if there was any possibility that one existed. By the time I finished, I was we finished. I, I was very, very certain that we had found no evidence of a conspiracy. Uh, and as time has gone on, uh, and let, let me say, I've also, and I think uh, from some of what 
Dale in particular has said here, there is no doubt that Lee Oswald shot John Kennedy. And yet if you read the typical conspiracy books, uh, Oswald is a peripheral figure. You, you don't ever find out who <laughs> Oswald really was. And I hope at right. some point in the course of the today, we can talk about this guy, Oswald, because the starting point is if he was the shooter, then uh, who was he? What was motivating him? And I'm as time has gone on, I've become totally satisfied uh, that what was going on in Oswald's life, and it was a very complex, and and, and uh, he, his life was essentially a failure. And he, he was at the point of his life uh, where uh, his ambitions were very high, but his life itself had, had collapsed. And if we understand Oswald and what he was doing, and there's all sorts of evidence to indicate that that, that he could not possibly have uh, formed an idea to shoot President Kennedy until just a couple of days before the uh, he did so. But you only yeah. know that by understanding what Oswald was do doing. Right. Well, we will come back to that, Bert. I, I do think it's important that we 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 take a look, good close look at Oswald. Um, I want to wrap up this little section with Alicia, and you touched on this uh, a little bit in your presentation. But um, you know, one of the things about our our program tonight is as 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 excellent as it is, and as thorough as it, as it, we hope it will be in making the case that you know Oswald killed Kennedy. Uh, he was a lone gunman. There are many people out there who will not be convinced. And we'll continue to believe in uh, in this. And so, you know, it's kind of a, 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 um, a, a strange country in that sense. But uh, I want to ask you about the, your perspective on this. You touched on it as an academically trained historian. You I think your mindset is you're not doing a police investigation when you look into this. You're looking at this from sort of with a bigger picture, with a different kind of eye. Can you kind of explain where you come from, where you're coming from on that and what you've learned about it? Sure. I mean, some of this might have to do with my training, but I'm, a, you know, I'm an agnostic about <laughs> most everything. And so I tend to enter questions with a lot of skepticism and go with what looks like to me the preponderance of the evidence. And so the preponderance of the evidence um, is that Oswald did this. And if new evidence should emerge of specific individuals who were involved in these questions, I'm certainly open to having my mind changed. Um, but if we're interested in evidence and not speculation and not what looks suspicious, I think we're going to come out uh, where these gentlemen tonight are suggesting we need to come out based on the evidence that they have delved into very, very deeply. And I would also say, you know, uh, historians want to do comparison and context as well. And in the four presidential assassinations that have existed, we know in Lincoln's case that there was, in fact, a conspiracy behind that assassination. It was a sort of like most like a lot of conspiracies. It doesn't exactly come off the way it was supposed to. Um, but we know there was a conspiracy in that case. Um, and then the other two, uh, Garfield, um, and uh, William McKinley are both killed by um, people with personal grievances or ideological, uh, you know, commitments that lead them to engage in these acts for their own personal reasons. So not conspiracies in either one of those cases. And so a lone gunman would actually be more to the pattern of presidential assassinations in the country. And it's also uh, young men um, who tend to be um, isolated and ideologically uh set apart from most other people in the community and they generally have some sort of grievance. I mean, so contextually Oswald also fits um, into the kind of people who do these kinds of crimes. And so that's, that's what I mean about sort of thinking about it in, in broader terms. It's like, how do we, how do we evaluate the evidence and how do we look at comparative cases and let that help us make decisions about where we come down on what is a very important question. Thank you. That's, that's that's exactly what I was hoping you we were going to uh, say, um, Dale. I want to dive a little bit deeper into the Zapruder film, and in particular, um, back in 1993, you created a computerized recreation of the JFK assassination that became a bit of a sensation, shall we say, when it debuted on ABC in 2003. Um, can you kind of, we're not, we, unfortunately, we don't have that 
animation to show tonight, but many people no doubt have seen it. And if they want to go see it, they can find it online. But can you explain how you got the idea for doing this and then kind of what the reaction was to it? Well, I got the idea actually back in 1975 after I saw the Zafruder film originally. And I thought, gosh, it's it's handheld, shaky film. You can't really see what's going on. And I actually toyed with the idea of getting two friends to sit and a couple of folding chairs. And then I would pose them in the exact positions that Kennedy and Conley were in. And then I would single frame film that with a Super 8 camera. And then I somehow end up with something that was smoother that you could see what was going on. I never did anything with it. And then flash forward 1993, I had gotten into computer animation in the early 90s. And uh, right about then, uh, 93, I, I realized there's a there's a tool here that you could do what I wanted to do way back when, but do it even better. I could actually bring up each Zapruder frame, look through it like a transparency, like a slide, and align it with a three-dimensional computer model and uh, actually recreate Zapruder's view in three dimensions. And then once I had that, once I had that match to the film, I could then flip the camera around and view that shooting from any angle. So uh, I began working on it just in my bedroom in Livonia, Michigan. And uh, interestingly, here we are, what, 30 some years, 40 years later, and no one has yet done what I did in 1993. Uh, which was to then match the film. And I remember it was a Wednesday night about 11 o'clock. I had enough of it. And I thought, let me do a trajectory analysis here. I think I've got enough where I could see where the bullet went. And at that time, I still thought, you know, okay, the, the Tippett shooting is a done deal, but the Kennedy assassination, maybe it came from one of these other buildings in, in the background. So anyway, I projected the trajectory uh, from Conley's wound to Kennedy's throat wound and just projected it rearward. And it goes right back through the sixth floor window. And I, I was astounded to be honest. And of course I thought, wow, the JFK research community is going to be really interested in this because then we don't have to argue about the bullets or anything anymore. We can just move on with maybe there's people behind them. So I put this out in a VHS the, the next year and uh, boy, I got hammered. Oh, they just, they hated me. They still hate me. And uh, about 10 years after that, as it turns out, Gus was the guy who introduced me to, to the Peter Jennings group and they put it on national television. I kind of did a facelift to the original 1993 work and uh, it circled the globe. And, you know, some people get it. And there's still a lot of people that have that bias. So they just can't for them. Seeing is not believing. Uh, so yeah. it, uh, it, it ultimately had an impact and I'm grateful for that and that I could be a part of that. But I tell people, you know, I didn't really do anything other than what the Warren commission had already done forensically from a yeah. forensic standpoint, as Gus mentioned earlier, you know, the, the fragments, the bullets in the car match the rifle in the sixth floor window there. I mean, there's no other way that it can, that it can work out. So all I did was show that this idea of a zigzagging bullet is absolute nonsense. Another, another, uh, related thing that i know you're familiar with is the um the matter of acoustics there was this uh this theory advanced at the house committee about uh about this can you kind of explain what that was well it gets real deep in the weeds so i'll do the very short version yeah. uh, the bottom line is is they had a dallas police tape that they thought they could hear gunshots on and but their entire work the HSCA work on the acoustics ended up being based on the assumption that there's a Dallas police motorcycle in a particular position with an open microphone that's picking up the sounds of these gunshots. Oddly enough, they said, you know, check the films, make sure he's there. And that was never really done. So I actually went back and I knew that these various eight millimeter films had been shot, not just the Pruders, but other films as the president drove through the plaza. And since that only happened one time, I knew that these films had to align in some way. So it took me about 18 months, but I basically synchronized all these films and figured out where H.B. McLean, the motorcycle officer that they thought was broadcasting the shots, where he was located. And it turns out that he's 180 feet from where he has to be if that acoustics evidence is correct. And in fact, there's no one else in the location where these shots are supposedly recording, supposedly emanating from. So in fact, the films don't support, and uh, the acoustics people said, 
that in order for their theory to be correct, for those gunshots to be of correctly analysis, uh, there has to be an open microphone where they predicted one to be. And in fact, there is not. So there is no acoustics evidence of a second gunman. Very good. Uh, Gus, I'd like, I'd like to go back to Cuba uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, it seems that, and you suggest, you've mentioned this in your presentation, but if there was any kind of a conspiracy to kill a president, it involved the interactions between Oswald and Cuban individuals in the months leading up to the shooting. Uh, can you kind of explain uh, what Oswald was doing uh, in, in that period of time? Uh, he, he traveled to Mexico City. He was interacting with other uh, Cubans in, in America. Uh, what was going on there? Well, you have to understand that when he came back from the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, uh, he he was he realized that wasn't the answer to, to his dreams of a perfect world. And he started fixating on Fidel Castro and he joined the Fair Play for Cuba committee. He handed out leaflets for Castro in New Orleans. Uh, and, you know, he, he did debates where he defended uh, on, on the radio. He defended Castro and the revolution. He argued with his wife, Marina, who was pregnant. Uh, he, if it was a boy, he wanted to name it Fidel. That was a big fight in the house. Can you imagine Fidel Oswald? Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, he had his only framed picture. His little, little apartment was of Fidel. So there was no doubt he was obsessed with Fidel Castro. And uh, I think... He wanted to be a spy. He wanted to be he wanted to be Castro's guy in New Orleans. And he wrote letters to the embassy, the closest place, the embassy in Mexico City. And they didn't take him seriously. So he ends up going down there at the end of this uh, in September of 63, goes to the embassy. So they'll take him seriously. Um, he uh, he brought all his clippings of all his activities with him, his sort of like, uh, uh, you know, resume of all the work he had done for Fidel and when he gets there, uh, the first people who saw him, they didn't know who he was. And you know, he thought they were all going to welcome him because he'd written these letters to them. And, uh, you know, they didn't. Uh, and so he goes to the, to the Soviet embassy to help him get a visa so he can go to Cuba. It's kind of complicated, but he really wanted to go to Cuba at that point. He wanted to get a visa and, and go to Havana and work for Fidel, I think. And uh, they turned him down. So then he gets really mad. And at one point, according to Fidel Castro, he yells out, I'll kill that bastard Kennedy. I'll show you how loyal I am to the revolution. Well, according to the people I've interviewed and others have interviewed in Mexico, uh, the Cubans took him a little more seriously at that point. And, and for our film we did in, in 2005, uh, Rendezvous with Death, and the book I wrote after that based on the film, uh, we spoke to a lot of people who said what happened was we took Oswald to safe places where we couldn't be watched or heard and to see what this guy was all about. And essentially to get to the point, Oswald wasn't hired by the Cubans. Uh, he said, he said he wanted to do it. They encouraged him. They even wanted, according to our sources, they even offered him money. And he said, no, it's not about money. It's about the revolution. Uh, then they did that one witness. We, I, we didn't use this in the film because we only had one person, but it was a good source in Havana, who knew the Oswald file. And he said that not only will you be a hero, they told Oswald, the Cuban intelligence people, you'll be a hero if you do this, we'll rescue you and, and take you back to Havana. Uh, but what this Cuban source said, what they were going to do was actually dump him over the Gulf of Mexico if they actually picked, if they picked him up in Dallas. That was the plan, according to what we were told. Uh, and there were some sketchy airplanes, private airplanes taking off from Dallas that day. Uh, going to in the direction of Cuba. So I think, can't prove it, obviously, but I think they were going to try to take him out. But J.D. Tippett messed up the whole plan. So that's, you know, in a, in a, in a just a nutshell, the um, what happened in in, uh, in in Mexico City. And it, whether it was true or not, when Lyndon Johnson and the FBI and the CIA got hints of this kind of thing, all hell broke loose because it, it would have been devastating if that was real, that the Cubans were linked to Oswald. So that brings on the cover-up of all things Mexico City. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I have so much ground to cover. I'm, I'm skipping around a little bit, but I want to hit on certain topics. And I want to come back to you, Alicia and Fred in particular. 
and talk about Jim Garrison. You know, somehow um, the the filmmaker Oliver Stone uh, transformed Jim Garrison into a hero and then convinced the very heroic-looking Kevin Costner to play him in a movie. And um, the real Jim Garrison was a very different kind of person. Can you guys – you can decide who goes first, but can you guys talk about really who he was and 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 what it was like in New Orleans when he was the DA – and then, and Alicia in particular, uh, how kind of his fear mongering way uh, uh, played into the homophobia of the you know, of that environment. Fred, you want to go first? <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, sure. Well, Jim Garrison was a, a very charismatic man. He he was very well read. He had a good sense of humor. He could think on his feet. He was very. Um, he could seduce a lot of people uh, with with the way he talked. Uh, uh, he, when he ran for a district attorney, he, he used television advertising as a means of getting into office. And once he was in office, he decided to go after all his opponents. He went after the judges. He went after the police. He went after the legislature. He went after everybody he could think of. And he won every battle. And he got all the headlines. He won every battle. Um, he had an awful lot of power. And one of the powers that he had was the power of subpoena. So he could not only subpoena you to come and testify before the grand jury, he could subpoena you to come and actually ask, answer questions in his office. And one of his ploys was to get you in front of the grand jury, have you testify, and then he would indict you for perjury. That would force you to get a lawyer. Um, it would cost you money. You couldn't travel out of the, out of the uh, jurisdiction without permission. Might have trouble getting a bank loan. And usually he was after something from you. Um, but if not, he would let you uh, just w- s- sort of blow in the wind until right before the trial, he would drop the charges. And so people were scared because they realized this man has a lot of power and he'll use it and uh, you'll end up in an awful lot of trouble. So he, he was a pretty scary guy. Yeah, I think um, I agree with everything Fred has to say about this, because I think we discovered the same things in looking at his sort of longer career as a district attorney. There was very little effective opposition to him by 1965. And he'd made some very canny moves, including, some, you know, uh, endorsing a guy who became governor named John McKithen. So he had sort of disempowered the local judges by winning a Supreme Court uh, case against them. Um, he was uh, getting more votes than the mayoral candidates. Um, he had won this uh, Supreme Court decision against the state attorney general who was basically neutered where he was concerned. So he really, you know, he had a lot of power and ability to do what he wanted to do. And I would also say that, you know, the office that he was running was an office that even prior to the Kennedy assassination, there had been um, some pretty serious allegation about uh, bribery in that office and bribery being centered around very high levels of arrests of gay men. And then sort of... Um, if they paid a bribe to somebody in Jim Garrison's office, those charges would go away. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these kinds of cases that are nolly prost. Now, you can't prove this, but this is in FBI documents. And the other thing I would say is that I was looking for material related to the potential of uh, a conspiracy having something to do with gay people. And even I was shocked <laughs> by how uh, this whole case is shot through with that kind of evidence or, you know, sort of accusation on all sides. And, and, you know, even Jim Garrison's own investigative papers at the National Archives have evidence that they are looking for someone to confirm uh, a pretty shaky testimony from a pretty shaky witness that Clay Shaw was Clay Bertrand. And um, I was using them in class today to talk to my students about this, about how he is identifying certain very vulnerable people and trying to get them to become, you know, a uh, confirming witnesses for the idea of Clay Shaw as a conspirator. And, you know, I guess the last thing that I would say about that is, yeah, I mean, gay people were scared in New Orleans. And Jim Garrison didn't create this idea of there being some sort of link between, uh, you know, being gay and being uh, otherwise criminal. But he was very canny at leveraging whatever tools he had around him. And this is one of the tools he had around him. And this kind of, uh, you know, outing of Clay Shaw didn't happen just once. I mean, there are people in his office feeding evidence to reporters about Clay Shaw right up until and then for long after uh, 
Clay Shaw is found not guilty. So this is this is a through line through that entire investigation, which, you know, people who are supporters of garrisons tend to deny. But the evidence is overwhelming. And, uh, you know, Fred has written about this. I've written about this. And if you're interested in the evidence that is available to you, I think it's hard to come to any other conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to hit on a couple more things before we we go to some audience questions. We've actually received a number of questions from the audience, and I, I'm really excited about giving them the chance to give you guys a chance to answer those. But before we do that, I, I want to go back to Fred and, and others can chime in on this as well. We, we need to um, talk about Paul Landis uh, briefly. Um, uh, Recently, a re- he's a retired Secret Service agent named Paul Landis published a book, and he did some media interviews related to the events of November 22nd and his involvement with them. And uh, could you kind of explain what Landis has said and kind of what the problems are with that claim? Well, Paul Landis was a Secret Service agent who was in charge of helping protect uh, Jackie Kennedy. And uh, basically this fall, he came out with a book that basically said that right after the assassination, he discovered a bullet lodged in the front on the, in the back seat where Jackie was sitting um, and that he took this bullet uh, and he placed it on a stretcher inside Parkland hospital. And he had never uh, said that before. And it caused a, a flurry of activity. Oh my God, this is a, another bullet. And what was this? Is, does this disprove the single bullet theory? And, and uh, conspiracy theorists were really quite pleased about this. Um, the, the reality is, is that right after the assassination, uh, Paul Landis wrote two reports in the week after the assassination, and he said nothing about this. Um, he could have said something. He didn't. In the 1980s, he was interviewed twice on two different occasions, and then he said he found a bullet fragment um, in, the, in the back seat and that he gave it to somebody. He didn't say who. And now he's come out with this new story, uh, which is completely different. So it speaks to credibility. Uh, it speaks to memory. Um, I can't speak to his motive, why he's doing it, but uh, um, he certainly sold a lot of books. And uh, I, I can't take him seriously, given the enormous difference in his stories that he's told over the years. Very good. Uh, can, I, can I say yep. something, uh, Jeff, yes. about this? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Paul Landis is a neighbor of mine. Uh, he, he he lives within walking distance of my house. Uh, he knows me. Uh, and uh, I'm a part of a discussion group uh, that meets on a frequent basis. About five years ago, he was invited to come to talk to our discussion group because he was uh, the kind of guardian, if I can use that term, of Jackie Kennedy and her kids. And he was he was the secret one of the Secret Service agents assigned to making sure that the kids were protected, in particular the kids, but much more so than Jackie. Uh, so uh, since he uh, was uh, in the motorcade and was present at the time the president was assassinated, we called him to come and talk to our luncheon group. Uh, it was about five years ago. He didn't say a word uh, about ever finding, having found anything, whether it was a bullet or a fragment or whatnot. Uh, so I think you got to put that also, Fred, uh, in, into the whole series of opportunities that he has had to tell this story about having find, found a bullet. And indeed, uh, we did a documentary, and that is uh, Todd Quaid and I, did a documentary, which also came out about five years ago, called Truth is the Only Client. And Todd asked to interview uh, uh, Landis. Uh, Landis declined to be interviewed because he said he was writing a book. So I, I, you, you got to believe that writing the book uh, and putting in this new information kind of helped him sell the book. I, I should add one. Th- I could, I, if I could add one thing, he he was interviewed by the House Select Committee on Assassinations, as well, and he did not right. mention the bullet or bullet fragments to the HSCA. And he was also interviewed by Steve Fagan at the Sixth Floor Museum, and he didn't mention anything about it. 
And, 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 and I'd I think like to the say six it. Floor, the sixth floor museum interview occurred after he himself says he he, he bang, began to remember it after reading the book by Tink Thompson. So so why was he why was he keeping this secret for so long? Even though he re- remembered it many years ago. And, and I was just going to say that the, the Paul Landis situation is not unique, as I'm sure Gus would be able to testify. I've run into all kinds that you run into all kinds of people who have changed their story over the time or have added details uh, that don't fit. So it's 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 not an uncommon thing. I mean, this is not unique to Paul Landis. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, can I throw something in there? Yes. Yes. Um, the, the thing that gets me about it is the way the writers of the recent articles promoting that book have couched it. The headlines all say uh, this changes the assassination, you know, the story. And I, I don't think Landis even asserts that. He says there was two or three shots from behind. Uh, so uh, and, and the fact that he found a bullet, let's assume for the sake of argument, he did. I don't I really am not sure he did at all. But let's say he did find a bullet. Well, it doesn't change anything. We knew somebody found the bullet and put it on the stretcher or somehow it got there. It's still the bullet that was tied to Oswald and to his rifle. Uh, it doesn't change anything. The story is essentially the same no matter who found the bullet. Right, right. Um, uh, we're getting very close to I'm survey looking at a lot of these questions from the audience, and they're all quite interesting. But I, before we get there, this is the Mob Museum, and so we have to talk about the mob a little bit. The uh, the what you know there are many theories, uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories that pin the assassination on a range of groups and individuals, uh, but the mob remains a popular culprit, and um, and probably the 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 mobster who gets the most attention in this way is Carlos Marcello, uh, who is the mafia boss of New Orleans. Um, Gus, can you can you speak to uh, the story of Carlos Marcello and and why he, you know, presumably wanted to kill Kennedy? No, I have no idea why he wanted to kill Kennedy because he <laughs> didn't. Uh, um, but other people uh, could would, would say that you know the House Select Committee uh, when they had this alleged acoustic thing of a fourth shot, it wasn't real. They had to come up with who was the fourth shooter, who, who was the other shooter uh, firing the fourth shot, and uh, Robert Blakey. Uh, postulated that it had to be uh, one of Marcello's people because Oswald uh, had lived in New Orleans and his uncle uh, 20 years ago had worked as a a bookie for Marcello in the 40s. And uh, this is really the most tenuous connection you've ever heard. Uh, And uh, and Marcello had allegedly said that uh, he wanted to kill Kennedy and so forth. And that wasn't true either. And we can go into all that about his alleged curse in Sicilian never happened. Um, and uh, so you know, they were just, you know, grasping at straws here, trying to say, well, if, if it was another shooter, it had to be the mob. There's no yeah. evidence. None. It's just supposition. And as you know, I, I know the Marcello family. I know his son, Joe, uh, who was uh, his partner in the 60s in his businesses. And uh uh, and I know for a fact that, you know, actually Joe's a really good guy and very shy. And uh, uh, he's beloved in, in the French Quarter. They owned four or five restaurants. They're big into real estate in New Orleans. That's really how the Marcellos made their money was in real estate. Um, and, um, you know, so uh, basically um, there's no evidence. But they needed somebody to take the rap. So let's just say the mob did it. You know, and, and Marcelo was in New Orleans when Oswald was there. So, you know, it had to be him. It, it's really awful. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Joe told me that his family really liked President Kennedy. Uh, and, um, you know, there you go. Well, the, can you explain just that part about this quote from, from Marcelo, if you can remember how it went and where it was published and how that kind of just fed on, they fed on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a sketchy uh, character by the name of Ed Becker uh, wrote a book with from his, Las Vegas from yeah. Las Vegas. You know all about him. Yeah. And I, and I interviewed him there a few times. He uh, he's gone now, but he had a book that he claimed that he witnessed Marcello cursing out president Kennedy in Sicilian at a barbershop. And uh, 
and, and there's a lot of things wrong with that because number one, uh, uh, Marcello didn't speak Italian or quote unquote Sicilian, um, and uh, uh, neither did Becker. So how would he know what he said? <laughs> how could he translate it? Um, uh, and Becker actually admitted to me. I said, "No way!" I, I confronted him with this. I said, "How do you really know this?" He said, "Well, it was my co-author put that in there." I said, "Excuse me." Uh, he said, "Well, it was, po it was poetic license, literary license." I said, oh, "Okay, we well, do you know where that literary license has started? That one curse of Marcello's created an industry that Marcello killed Kennedy, and it was never true." Um, so you know that's where it stemmed from. Ed Becker. And he blamed it on his partner. I don't know if that's true. I'm, Becker could have made it up. But there you go, you know, based on okay. nothing. Well, very good. I have uh, like three more pages of notes, which we won't get to. Uh, but I do want to uh, take on some of the questions from, from our audience. And uh, a number of them are very conspiracy-oriented. But I think you guys are, are up for uh, <laughs> tackling a few of these. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll paraphrase is and this is for Gus, probably, um, you know, where was where basically where was Oswald going after after uh, the assassination? In other words, was he you know going to meet a Cuban operative somewhere or did he think that was what he was doing or what do you think he was? What was the what was where was he going? Yeah, after? well, obviously, it's, it's subjective at this point or conjecture. Uh, we don't know. We can't get into his head, but you could postulate that he was trying to get out of Dodge. He was, he had enough money to get on a bus and uh, again, Tippett messed up all his plans and he had to go run and hide in a movie theater. I don't think he was headed for a movie theater when he left his rooming house, he was headed somewhere else. Now, if you've spoken to the people I have, the Cubans who tell me that uh, they were going to rendezvous with him. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's what some of them say. They were going to rendezvous with him to kill him. Uh, and obviously, I didn't know that uh, part of the story. Uh, so I don't know where he was going. Uh, I'm guessing he was going either going to a rendezvous or uh, trying to get out of Dallas. And he had enough money to get to the Mexican border, of all things. And he did have a bus transfer on him at the time he was arrested. That was good for only one bus stop in Oak Cliff. And that was at the Marcella Street bus stop, which was only two blocks from where Tippett was shot. So was he trying yeah. to make good that bus stop? David Bellin of the Warren Commission speculated maybe he's trying to make good that, uh, that bus transfer, which would then take him uh, south, probably as far as the Greyhound bus station in the south part of Dallas, and then, like Gus said, uh, maybe to Mexico. Yeah. Uh, this one could be for uh, Fred or Alicia or anybody, probably. Um Timothy writes, uh, Oswald was in David Ferry's Youth Air Corps. Apparently there's photos that show this. Uh, and David uh, was also training Cuban mercenaries to invade Cuba. Um, was there any significance to this, that, uh, that possibly there's a David Ferry connection? Uh, not really. I mean, I mean David Ferry, uh, for around three months in 1955, took over uh, one... Uh, one civil air patrol uh, section in New Orleans, and Oswald went to a few meetings. Um, Ferry never denied that that he had run into Oswald. He, he said Oswald wasn't familiar uh, when he was questioned uh, in 1963. He really didn't remember Oswald, but it was kind of familiar. And what's really strange is that some of uh, Ferry's friends actually called him up and said, well, you know, Oswald was there. Um, you were in camp with Oswald. And Ferry then called up the FBI to tell them, yes, yes, it is true. Um, Oswald and I were together in CAP. Uh, I just don't really remember him. Look, <clears throat> it's there's there's nothing to it. I mean, uh, Ferry did not know Oswald in 1963. Their paths did not cross. It was just a chance meeting for a couple of times in 1955 when Oswald was a teenager. And he, I would just add to that. That's that's I, I agree. I would add that, you know, when he is questioned again by the district attorney's investigators in 1966, he says that he says, I have been told by a number of people, third, fourth, fifth hand, that I had interacted with Oswald in the cap division, but I don't have any memory of it. And at the same in the same interview, he also says, you know, I'll take a lie detector test. Um, and that he's not taken up on that. But he said, you know, I'll take soda, sodium pentothal. I'll take a lie detector test. And, you know, you know, 
in a culture where being gay um, and being interested in adolescent males was very, very illegal. Um, the, you know, the idea that he was willing to be as lugubrious as he was when he was interviewed suggests that as crazy as some of his stories sound, um, that he was telling the truth about this matter. That's, uh, that's how I would see it on balance. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, can I jump in there? I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When we were doing the frontline research, which was two years of research, I was practically living in New Orleans. I went, I had a, a listing of all the Civil Air Patrol guys and their home addresses from the FBI. And I just went around door knocking and I heard about this photo that, that was taken that they were kind of afraid to show and they didn't, they didn't want to get, you know, in trouble with being involved with the assassination. And eventually uh, we did frontline. We did get that photo for the first time. And um, uh, and we there's like seven people in the photo, including Oswald and Ferry. I've got one hanging a copy of it hanging on my wall here. Uh, and I went around to all the people in that photo, all the young boys who had grown up. And I asked them about what was going on. And uh, they said, well, Oswald was only at one of these bivouacs, they called them, because uh, his mother wouldn't let him stay in the Civil Air Patrol. Well, you know, she only went to one. He, and, to their re recollection, he never spoke to David Ferry. There was no, David Ferry just happened to be there. And that one, so here we, frontline, we found this great photo and we, we had a press conference and basically said, but it doesn't mean anything. You know, there they are together in the same photo. But ultimately, we had to tell, the, you know, we could have parlayed it into a big conspiracy thing. But based on our due diligence, it amounted to just a coincidence. And the story that was told about Oswald and Ferry was far more elaborate, right? right. And that he had yeah. taught him to use a gun with a sight right, right. and that he had hypnotized him with a post-hypnotic suggestion <laughs> to kill the president. And this would have had to be, you know, several years to several months earlier. So the, the story, you know, is not a reliable story. Yeah, exactly. Think, you know, think back to when you were a kid and you probably still have these pictures in a box somewhere of your of your eighth grade class or your 10th grade class and you're all lined up how many people can you even remember their names right you probably interacted with them when you at the time in one way or another but do you remember them did you actually spend do anything with them probably not you know yeah or, or it, would a substitute teacher remember all the students they had he had for right. for one class exactly um so we have a question and i think i understand this question you guys certainly will uh shauna asks I am curious about the change in the secret schedule uh, mentioned in the show, Who Killed JFK? Why was it changed so late? I think they're talking about Kennedy's schedule. Is that correct? The route, probably. The Maybe the route. route yeah. Changing the route. That's a misnomer. The route was published in the paper. What the? I think the paper showed it coming down. The show coming down Main Street? But in, in any event, I think it showed it coming down Main Street. It kind of skipped a little jog there on Elm and then onto the Stemmons Freeway. But anybody from Dallas would know, well, you can't, there's a big curb there. You can't just hop this curb. You'd, everybody in Dallas knew, well, it's got to come down Elm Street. So I think that's where it first got its legs is that okay. it was repeated that in that way, that the motorcade route had been changed at the last minute, but it's not really true. And, and it, 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 the map didn't show the Elm Street turn, but the, the text in the paper did. So it actually mentioned uh, Elm Street in the paper. Interesting. Uh, another question for you, Dale. Uh, did Officer Tippett know Jack Ruby from the Carousel Club? And was the officer ever seen with Oswald at the club? I don't think Oswald ever went there, as far as I know. No, Tippett was not a drinker either. Uh, so Tippett did not know Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby did know an officer Tippett. There were three on the force, and he knew one that was in the downtown area, but that was not J.D. Tippett. And there's no indication that's believable that J.D. Tippett knew Lee Harvey Oswald either. There was a, a, a report that they, uh, at, at the Dobbs restaurant, that Tippett was in there and shot a glance at Oswald a couple of a week before or something before the uh, assassination. But there'd be no reason. This would be way out of Tippett's district. No reason for him, if he's going to have coffee, to go way out of his district to have coffee. When, in fact, there's a half a dozen coffee shops there in his own district if he wanted to stop and have coffee. So it's just not believable. And, yeah. uh, you know, Tippett was a family man. uh a homebody when he when he wasn't working for the Dallas police force, he's moonlighting a couple of jobs to make ends meet. So 
No, he did not know Jack Ruby or uh, Oswald. Hey, Bert, this one's for you. Uh, Jim asks, he says, I thought, I think there's something to this. I thought Ruby's excuse was that he did not want Jacqueline Kennedy to go through the ordeal of a trial uh, making her return to Dallas. That's why he shot Oswald. Well, it's one of a couple of things he only said, particularly after consulting with his lawyers and being encouraged to say that. But in, in uh, you look at the first thing he said to Forrest Sorrells uh, after he was arrested, when Forrest Sor- Sorrells asked him why he did it, he said, I had to show the world a Jew had guts. Uh, and uh, it really goes back to what I said much earlier, uh, that he was obsessed with the idea that Jews were going to be blamed for the assassination. And so he saw himself uh, as Kennedy's avenger by uh, a killer. And, it, and it, may, it may be that this was something that was, was a little bit on his mind, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't what was driving him. What was driving him was that his concern about uh, uh, anti-Semitism and how that was going to affect the Jewish community. Gotcha. Um, uh, uh, one of our audience members named John, uh, this is pro- this could be for anybody, but he says, recently it was reported that there are more than 4,400 pieces of documentation that now two presidents, Trump and Biden, ha- won't release. Um, he says, why not release it all now, 60 years down the road? I'll, I'll be happy to take that. Oh, Fred, Fred. Well, right uh, people don't realize that the only documents that are withheld in full uh, in this case are IRS documents and some grand jury testimony. And those documents are exempt from the JFK Records Act. All the other documents, the CIA documents in question, have been released, but with some redactions. So they're all out there. Why are, why are there redactions? Well, yeah, I'm sorry, Bert, go ahead. Well, Fred, an example of this is is one that was recently revealed, and that was uh, the, I, I can't now remember the name of this CIA, CIA uh, employee, but uh, he was opening all of the mail that went between uh, Oswald and the Soviet Union. We we saw every one of those letters, and what was what was withheld was the name of this guy that was opening the mail. <laughs> and of course, uh, the CIA has reasons for not wanting to reveal the names of any of its employees. But but there was nothing of substance that, that we didn't see. That's right. And if you look at there's around 400 documents that have redacted social insurance numbers of people who are still alive. I don't think those documents should be released. The names of informants who are still alive, who are promised anonymity, when they became informants, and of course, there's some sensitive intelligence gathering yeah. methods from the Cold War. What people don't realize is that the Assassinations Records Review Board saw all of these documents. And Judge Tonheim has been very, very clear. There's nothing in those documents of substance. Yeah. You know, we, have, uh, uh, we are getting along in time. And we did promise that what we want to do is give each of our panelists uh, – an opportunity to sort of have some closing remarks. And uh, I have to, I have to stress that we have to be brief, Uh, but I wanted to go through our group uh, again and give you guys a chance to sort of just, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes max, just like kind of your closing thoughts on this. What would you say to somebody if you uh, were just summarizing this or, or your main point that you'd like to leave people with tonight? Um, Gus, maybe you can go, go first again. Uh, boy, uh, what would I want to leave? Um, if you read one book, I'm not even going to suggest mine, although uh, if you read two books, you read mine. The, the one book I would suggest reading uh, is one that most conspiracy people haven't read, won't read. It's uh, uh, Marina and Lee, because it's critical to know who these people were that were at the center of this. If you read one book, read that. When, you, when you're done with that book, I guarantee you, you will know who Lee Harvey Oswald was. And he was a violent guy. He was a very um, disturbed guy. And, um, and Marina just laid it all out in that book about who he was and that she believed and knew that he did it. 
he killed Kennedy. So um, read books, learn who Oswald is. Instead of looking at Alan Dulles and uh, Clay Shaw and all the other stuff out there, start with Oswald. And if you, if, you, if you do that, you know, I, th- I think you'll figure it out real quick. Very good. Dale? Uh, I would say if you're going to read one book, uh, read The Warren Report. You know, the vast majority of people, I'm telling you, have never read The Warren Report. They read all the conspiracy books. They don't read the uh, the the, uh, the mother of it all, you know. Uh, another thing I'd like to get across is that, uh, you know, a lot of people will look at a lot of us on the panel here and say, well, you came into it with a bias. And it's like, no. No, we actually overturned every rock we could to find uh, the answer for, for me personally, it was just to find uh, the answer that would satisfy my own curiosity about the case. And one of the things that I found and, and Fred touched on this earlier is there's been a lot of uh, wreckage along the way. There are a lot of people in talking to police officers and witnesses and the Tippett family in particular, they were raked over the coals for no reason at all by conspiracy theorists who had all kinds of suspicions and nothing else. And finally, I would say that uh, Oswald was probably the uh, the modern day sociopath, maybe the first one, uh, who had been marginalized his entire life, been kicked around, and if you could boil it down to one thing, he felt that he was somebody to be reckoned with. And I think on that Wednesday, when he saw that the motorcade was going to come right past where he worked, he decided to seize opportunity and show the world that in fact he was somebody to be reckoned with. Yeah. Bert, uh, well, how do you wrap things up? Uh, there is no unsolved murder mystery. Uh, and so I think we all agree. Uh, Oswald did it. Uh, Ruby shot Oswald. They did it alone. They had no connection with each other. Uh, I want to urge you to read all of these books, but I want to reinforce uh, what Gus said. I think the most important book you can read is Marina and Lee by... Uh, 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 Priscilla. Uh, yeah, Priscilla, Priscilla McMillan. McMillan. Priscilla McMillan. Absolutely superb book. Uh, and uh, you'll understand who Oswald was. And if you can understand who Oswald was, uh, that's, a, that's the answer to the question of why he did it. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Alicia? Yeah. Um, so I would just say a couple of quick things. One is, you know, I teach about Louisiana and um, I also teach about conspiracy. And I, I think the prosecution of Clay Shaw was not the only time where uh, people have been treated very badly in the legal system uh, in this state. And um, to get justice in this state has often been difficult for um, all kinds of people who are marginalized for any number of reasons. And Clay Shaw, though he was marginalized because of his sexuality, was a wealthy person, was a well-to-do person. He was able to afford justice uh, in this case in the courts. But that's not always the case. Um, and, and I think that's an important part of thinking about, you know, what the relationship between civil rights and Jim Garrison's investigation and prosecution were. And those are important things. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, I think we need to be skeptical about this idea that uh, the Kennedy assassination was a turning point in American history. It's not that it's not that it's not important, but there was not a golden age in the United States before November 22nd, 1963. And there were plenty of people who felt uh, sidelined and ignored by their government. Uh, this is before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, there, there's a lot of people who were not uh, in not just in love with Kennedy, um, but didn't feel he had their interests at heart. So this this is a narrative that gets told that our nation will never be right again unless we <laughs> resolve the Kennedy assassination. And that, too, I think is kind of um, a canard. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of conclude things by oh, saying. Uh, do I get yes. a final word? Oh, oh, my gosh, Fred. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> I, turned, I literally turned the page and I had already marked your name. Please go ahead. Please. Well, one thing I would suggest, if for people who are watching who believe in conspiracy, open up one of your conspiracy books and make a list of all the different, you know, conspirators and all the different activities that are get done, the extra bullet, the, the, the bullet fragments that are planted, uh, the gunmen here, the gunmen there, the FBI agents who are in on the cover up, make a list of every single thing in that book and then try to create a narrative around it. 
<laughs> something that makes sense that puts all of this together into a coherent narrative. How you tie in Clay Shaw and Jack Ruby and you know the hundreds and hundreds of conspirators and cover up artists. Try and put it into a narrative. You won't be able to do it. It doesn't fit. It'll make you. It'll. It makes it all seem so ridiculously silly. Try that exercise. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Sorry about that, Fred. Uh, as as we close out tonight's program, I want to thank our panelists for their time and their terrific insights into this. You know, admittedly, very complicated and controversial topic. There's so many things we could talk about tonight that we didn't get to. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Mob Museum staff members who have worked very hard to make this a successful program. Um, And I want to thank everyone out there who's taking the time to watch this program live. I want to mention, too, that we've been showing, uh, you know, intermittently tonight the picture of the books by our panelists. And, you know, these books are available on the Mob Museum website. This is important if you want to buy them and you want to buy them through the Mob Museum. We have them available uh, for purchase. So I encourage you to do that. You know, we've recommended uh, a great book, a couple of great books. Uh, certainly you can find the Warren Commission report uh, pretty easily and, and uh, Marina and, and Lee. But I think these books too are, are essential reading for anyone who wants to dive deeply into this topic. Uh, so uh, please. And then uh, finally, uh, if you found this discussion enlightening, uh, if if you have, please tell your friends and relatives uh, because a recorded version of this program will be available online as soon as we can get it ready. And uh, so you, you can do that. You can read the books. You can, uh, you know, you can watch this program and share it with others. And uh, hopefully we've, uh, we've done a service tonight. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, good night. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And um, that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.